All right, it looks like we have just about everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Stacy Miller. I'm the director of WVU's Industrial Extension. Um, we are thrilled to host this call today. As many of you know, we received some funding to support education sessions about supply chain in order to help as many small manufacturers as possible throughout West Virginia. You know, we know the more we make here in America, the stronger our manufacturing economy becomes. So the goal of this session, along with the four additional ones that we're gonna host, um, are intended to provide you with information to understand what supply chain really means and how our West Virginia companies can use a practical approach to entering new markets if you're interested and if you're capable to do so. We currently don't offer any supply chain services you know, framed up in that context. Um, so we also want to learn as much as we can about the interests that you have, the needs that you have, um, the barriers and the questions that you have so that we can help support your needs and build services around it to better provide information and content for you. So we have, have an expert with us, Adam Lowe. He's an expert in supply chain and has a really practical approach to implementing strong practices and avoiding potential pitfalls. Adam's a native West Virginian. He's a graduate of WVU. He served in the military. And in addition to having extensive experience working with a tier one DOD supplier, he has started a consulting practice to support this nationwide effort to bring manufacturing back to America. And you know, we hope to bring as much as possible to West Virginia. So as a reminder, this session is being recorded so that you can play it back as needed or if any of your colleagues um, weren't able to attend and want to see it, they'll have access to that. So you can catch up on this one or any of the other sessions that we'll be hosting this month. Um, as we, as I turn it over to Adam, make sure that you put your questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring those. And um, if it's appropriate and the time works, I'll interrupt Adam and we can bring that conversation in as, as he's speaking. If not, we'll hold it and wait till the end. And so again, we're excited to have you here. Adam, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome and thanks for being here with us. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Stacy, And thanks to everyone on the WVU uh, IE team. Um, fantastic uh, organization you got there. You're doing great things, making great strides in West Virginia. And um, I can't be happier to support. Um, as as Stacy said, I am a native West Virginian and West Virginia is very near and dear to my heart. In fact, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, throughout the presentation today. Um, and so, so kind of laying a framework for what we're going to do throughout the series, um, I, I will I will explain more at the tail end, uh, a little bit more in depth. But um, up front, what we're looking to do, uh, or what I was looking to do here, is to kind of go on a on a on a journey of sorts um, from from supply chain thinking, how you can look at a supply chain as not being a separate entity from your group or stovepiped in any way, uh, but it's actually a very integral part of the overall operation. So we're going to talk a lot about that. We're going to talk about, you know, like Stacy said, some um, some advantages, um, some perhaps disadvantages and ways you can operate your supply chain and things um, and how to fix those. So there's a lot coming. So I would encourage um, uh, regular attendance. You know, we, we would love to see you coming. We would love to see more of your folks coming um, and uh, and really spread the word uh, for the folks in West Virginia, because um, that is uh, kind of our, our own comment, as, as Stacy was uh, saying, you know, we, we want to build back up manufacturing, you know, nationwide, but. I would love to start with West Virginia and be the leader. So let's do that. Um, so I, I hope everybody can see my screen. Uh, it, let me know if you can't <laughs> raise a hand or holler. Um, uh, so I'm just going to go through. Uh, and so kind Adam, of we, can't, we can't just yet. Okay. All right. I, I, so, let's see if I can go back in and share again. Maybe it got kicked off there. Yep. Let's share. Well, let Looks me know like, if you can. Here we We're good to go. All right. There we go. Technology. Fantastic. We'll talk a lot about technology in, in number five. So <laughs> uh, if you stick around that long with me, you'll, 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 we'll, we'll start talking some tech and, and future states. So, um, as Stacy said, I am Adam Lowe. Uh, I am um, I'm from the state of West Virginia. I, I'm not going to go through this because I've, I've got a lot to say. This is just a, a snapshot and overview of what we're going to chat about today. It's just a quick introduction. Uh, and then we'll get into leveraging your supply chain and your business and big picture thinking. So like I said, this is a thinking session uh, and kind of a philosophy section of how we're going to look at, um, at supply chain 
uh, in the big picture, you know, in the, in the large scale. Um, supply chain, um, it means a lot of things to different people, depending on where you are. Some organizations have very tight supply chain and, and some, um, as far as a definition goes, and some are very broad. I'm going to go from a very broad uh, perspective. But first off, who am I and, and, and why do I matter? Uh, let me get some of this moved over so I don't have a, a bunch of stuff on the screen. So my name is Adam Lowe. Uh, I did go to WVU in 2008. Um, after that, I went into the United States Marine Corps. Um, uh, I've had many jobs uh, in w both related and not related to supply chain. I've been in manufacturing for the past eight years at a defense contractor, one of the top five defense contractors in the country. Um, I've been in many different roles there. I've been in production. I've been in uh, on manufacturing general management. I've been in uh, supply chain management. And that's where I actually am today. That's my day job. And this is my, uh, this is my mission job. This is my favorite. This is my heart job uh, is what I get to do in my consulting practice. So uh, look forward to, to kind of giving you some of those knowledge and hopefully giving you an edge out there. Uh, I did go back to WVU for my MBA in 2001. Um, after I got out of the Marine Corps and was, uh, was actively working um, as, in manufacturing, uh, which was fantastic to get a little bit of experience under my belt and then go back and see how this business, uh, the business training at WVU uh, could apply. And it, and it very much does. So I would uh, encourage anybody who's thinking about maybe going back, go back. It's worth it. Um, and then I started Orchard Street Solutions. That's the, uh, the consulting practice that I, that, I, um, that I operate. And I'm um, essentially all things business and to a degree, I'm manufacturing uh, focused, I'm, I'm uh, management focused, uh, strategy and operations focused in that practice. Um, and so then I highlighted my why, and this is where we'll kind of start. Um, again, big picture, uh, philosophical thinking. Um, most companies have a value, uh, that, or value, a set of values or missions or visions or um, uh, with lots of different company, uh, calls, companies call it different things. I call it my why. Why did I start my um, consulting practice? Well, my why is to support the, the businesses in the state of West Virginia and surrounding areas, um, specifically so that they can go out and hire people, hire uh, family members. My family members, it's likely, because I have a ton of family in West Virginia. So I want the, the whole economy of the state to do better for the families of the, of, of, in the state of West Virginia. And the reason I mention that is because that's my guiding principle so as we're talking about supply chain, we're going to be connecting in the supply chain to your company's guiding principles. And if there's a disconnect there, it can cause uh, major, major issues. So as we're, as we're thinking through understanding your company value, your company why, your company you know, mission or vision, um, and aligning your supply chain um, is extremely important. Let me advance here. So the quick supply chain overview, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. You have a wide view. Uh, which can be, which is which is my view. Uh, there's a narrow view, uh, and that's more of a historical view, uh, kind of a stovepipe view of supply chain. You have a supply chain person or a supply chain group, and they go out and get material for your your company, and that's that's just what they do. They don't need to be involved in the other practices. We just want them going out and either, you know, getting a purchase order on the books or or you know finding a vendor or uh, something like that. So um, that was fun, and it's not a terrible way of operating. Um, but I believe you lose a lot, um, especially in today's market where you need speed, um, you need communication, um, and, and that's extremely important. So um, lately, the, the supply chain view uh, kind of industry in, in larger industries has been kind of expanding to be more integrated with operations. You know, the speed of business, you'll hear it called. We got to go faster. We got to move quicker. We got to make better decisions, um, all of those different things. So uh, so that means the supply chain organization has been less stovepiped and it's moving further in that direction uh, to be more integrated in your operation from start to finish. So it's very, very wide. Um, and then you, you do have what's considered an internal and external um, supply chain. So internal supply chain is, is the way I frame it out is kind of building what you do internally and passing it along internally um, to yourselves. That could be lower level items that you build that go into a next higher level item and then eventually you sell it off. So you're kind of supplying yourself internally. Um, very large organizations uh, do this regularly. Um, and you can even have operations in another state that supply you know, yourself with internal operations and, and all that. So that's kind of your internal supply chain, like what you're doing internal to, to, to move the chain forward um, in, in, inside. Build structure, uh, you will hear it called as well. There's, there's a lot of different terms for it as we all know. And then, uh, yeah, the key point there is that supply chain really these days touches everything. And that's how we want to look at it so that we can leverage that 
um, for our own benefit, leverage it for the benefit of our vendors and uh, leverage it for, you know, our, our bottom line um, and all the employees who are, who are working in our company. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. Um, leveraging your supply chain. And actually, you know what, I'll stop because I have to remember to stop. And, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, I, I want to at least give a pause because <laughs> I can get going. Yeah, nothing's coming in the chat. Nothing's coming to the chat yet. All right, very good. Well, I'll keep on rolling then. Uh, and okay. if you do have okay, questions, because... by all means. I will. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, just just holler at me, raise a hand, uh, uh, send a signal, and I'll and I'll I'll I'll, I'll shut up for a second. Um, so so we'll move on to leveraging um, your supply chain and that vision of of what we're going to do. And this is um, kind of what started. Uh, my whole thought process for the, this series is getting um, an alignment together for your supply chain uh, group within your company. Why? So I mentioned my company. Why? Um, in my, my vision, my, my mission for my company. Um, what it creates is an element of alignment um, within your company that you can use internally to uh, for for motivational purposes and and all those good things so that you're all marching to the beat of the same drummer. So um, the way that works specifically with your supply chain organization is just shows that you're operationally in alignment. Um, and 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 then also it's the view both internal and external of whether or not you are operating um, kind of congruently uh, as a company. Um, and and I wanted to to kind of highlight this piece because. Uh, oftentimes, we have a very great alignment with our values and um, and our mission internally, because that's, you know, our operations folks, we talk to them every day. Uh, and, and so they're kind of, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's easier to communicate that why, it's easier to communicate that value, and it's easier to operate within the, that structure. Um, when you start bringing in vendors, or you become a vendor, and you're in someone else's, you know, kind of supply chain, um, it gets a little bit it gets a little bit more um, difficult. What I've seen in historically in supply chains is, is you have a, an internal mission potentially. And then when you try to um, bring in vendors, they might not fit within that, that internal mission. So in order to stay kind of in alignment together, um, explaining throughout your whole organization, including your supply chain, your mission and your vision um, is really important when they're reaching out to bring on vendors as well, because it, it, it shows that there is, um, there's, a, there's a standard for how you are going to uh, bring on and how you want to, um, how you want to display your company to, to the world. So in practice, what that might look like is if you are a, um, a company who holds um, uh, environmental issues, let's say that's one of, one of your key values is being environmentally friendly. Um, and then your supply chain department person, procurement, you know, your vendor selector goes out into the world and finds some very, very awesome vendors who just don't fit into that scope. Um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a messaging that is, that is incongruent within your, within your employee group. It's incongruent with your company values. It's, and you're going to lose your messaging there. So your supply chain group actually reaches outside of your company. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a little easier to align the value with your operations structure internally it's a little bit harder to ensure that your vendors are falling within that line as well. So since your supply chain is reaching out and reaching those vendors, making sure that they have a really strong understanding of your values can dictate like maybe a vendor that they don't, you know, they don't uh, even entertain a bid for because they don't, they don't source their materials uh, the same way you would source your materials. And, and that's a key uh, element of your value. So alignment is, is extremely important. Um, for employee and customer and vendor view, that's kind of a, a, a similar view. For your employee view, you don't want to send the wrong messaging. Like, yes, we are uh, environmental elements are very important to us, but we're going to source this material from whoever we can get it from. Don't care what they do with the environment. That's a messaging that's it makes it hard to leverage that as um, as a motivator for your employee. So your supply chain there can have a big impact on the motivation of your operations employees. Uh, by saying, well, we get this stuff from this vendor. We know they're not clean. We know they're not. So as long as your structure and your alignment is accurate, it's going to help everybody to row in the same direction. Um, another thing, 
uh, which is important. And I don't know that folks look at this um, in, in all organizations, some do, but one way you can use uh, your supply chain is to leverage um, who you're working with, how you're working, um, your vendors, the people you're, you know, um, your customers, uh, look at what they're there. You use your use that source to get a foot in the door and understand potential other products that you have the ability to make that your customers or your vendors might need. So you can um, in in discussions with your supply chain folks when you're setting down and you're doing terms and conditions or you're doing um, you know maybe a quote or a bid for um, a another another group you can learn a lot. You can use that as an opportunity to kind of fill out. Um, where there might be other areas that you can expand your business with that vendor or with that supplier of your, or of your own. Um, we've, I've seen many instances where, um, you know, company gets together, they think we've got this vendor, they're supplying us with a particular material, this is all well and good. Later on down the road, at some point, they learn that that vendor is really struggling getting a certain part from their sources. They just, they don't, they don't have regular deliveries. They don't have on-time deliveries. All those things um, are impacting their ability to sell other stuff. And it's just through that communication and that relationship you have. Well, if you have the ability to potentially create another product line, you know, to, to support there, and it won't always happen, but if it does, that's another source of revenue that you might not have ever learned if you weren't really thinking about those supply chain um, positions as a strategic way to look into other realms and find out what it, what is possible for your group. Um, so that's, that's one way that, that you can kind of continue those discussions, um, reaching out, uh, looking at wider ranges of what you can do with your operation. And that um, with the foot in the door of supply chain and being out into the world and reaching out into the world um, and not being so focused internally, um, that's, that's a way to definitely leverage um, those, those uh, feet in the door, uh, as it were. And then solution creation. This is another uh, a big one. So everything we do in manufacturing is providing um, is providing a, a solution to a problem. It's what, it's what products are. Uh, you need something. You want something. You have this lack of something. So somebody's building it. Um, another way we can look at that is what problems are we seeing in the market? What problems are we seeing our vendors have? And, and how can we create solutions for this? How can we make it easier for our customers, how can we make something easier for our vendors? Um, you know, that's something I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in session number three, talking about best practices. Um, how can we support our vendors? You know, a lot of the times, it's 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 very easy to, you know, set up a contract. You have a delivery date. It's all well and good, and then you kind of forget about it and hope that your vendor uh, delivers on time. You might have some regular communication with them, which is good practice, but. Um, you know, you don't you, you you don't really start digging into as many of the issues that they're having and looking at a way that you can potentially help them. Um, so that's something that you can look at is like creating solutions. Um, one one example of that might be, um, you know, you have a vendor that reaches back out to you and says, hey, you know, we know that we signed up for a particular date to deliver this, but, you know, a subcomponent, we're having problems with it. Um, our vendor says they can't get it in from whoever. Um, it's easy to say, okay, well, you, you know, you signed up for this contract, so you, you really need to do everything you can do to get it in. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a strategy. Another strategy might say, well, what component is it that you're, that you're missing? What, you know, what, what, what can we do to help? You might have a, an existing relationship with another supplier that there's that, that is supporting this group that you can leverage that net networking with, you can leverage that um, uh, kind of a relationship with, or you might even have that part on hand. So understanding the needs of your vendors who are supplying you and then understanding uh, what your uh, customers might be needing as well. Um, it's another way to start looking for a solution creation and potential other sources of revenue. Um, I, I won't go, those are just some examples. And again, we're going to go more in depth in that in, in number, in, in uh, number three in, in, in uh, the webinar that we're doing in a couple of weeks. So um, that's just a kind of a taste of that. Uh, but it's a way of, of thinking bigger picture with your supply chain and leveraging your supply chain and the, and the um, relationships you've already got and have built up. Are there any questions there? Anything coming in? Not yet. All right. Very good. Oh, um, I just got one. Okay. Fantastic. Just come in. Let me see here. What are the characteristics of companies in a supply chain? Number of employees, the facility's footprint, sales volume, 
number of widgets, ownership? Is there a typical provider in supply chain in general? No, honestly, no. I mean, it, it depends. Um, there's, and we'll tell you again, we're going to, Ooh, this is great. This is a great question because we're going to talk a lot about this. So this is good. Um, there's not, not necessarily, uh, you know, we, um, at, at the, at my, at my day job, we'll call it, we have vendors that are small mom and pop shops and we're, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. Like we, you know, we're in a, we're in a very, very large company. So there's no kind of cookie cutter, um, framework for someone within someone else's supply chain. Essentially it's, someone who either takes a raw material, adds value to it, and then passes that to a customer. That's the most basic type of a supply chain, all the way up to people who just make any kind of a widget that someone else needs. So, um, and that can even be um, intellectual property. You know, you can be a supplier of intellectual property. I'm, an, I'm a supplier. I'm supplying intellectual property right now. I've taken what I've learned. Um, I've framed it out. Uh, and, and now I'm, I'm using it. I've, I've taken all the good things that I've done and a whole heck of a lot of bad things I've learned from them and I've, I've condensed it into best practice. And now I'm giving it to someone else. So I've taken some raw material out there. I've created some value in it. And now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm passing it on down the line. So, I mean, supply chain can be, uh, and like I said, there used to be this historic view that a supplier had to be a certain thing. And the way that we're looking that, at that now is, um, you are both actively, if you're manufacturing something or you're selling a product, you are both a, on the supply chain, you're, you're, you're a supplier and you're one being supplied at some point, most likely, unless you are extracting raw material and you're selling it directly to a, well, even then you're on the supply chain, but you were just one link <laughs> of the supply chain. So there isn't really a typical, and especially for like large businesses, um, it's really how good you are at creating the thing you create and how much value you're creating. Uh, you know, and then that could be in the speed at which you can turn around a, a product. Um, that's a, that's a huge thing. Uh, um, the quality, you know, you might be, uh, you know, someone who makes one thing, but you do it better than anybody else in the world. You might have five people in your shop um, and that's it. And, and, and you build this thing and it's extremely valuable. And you might have people all over the world wanting your thing because you're good at it. So there isn't really a typical or a standard, um, for someone that is, a, is on the supply or a company that is on a supply chain or how that works. Um, it, it really just, um, and again, this is a great question because it, it, it's, um, it, it works its way into the, the thinking and how you think of yourself. Um, you can, you, you can think, well, I'm in my, my community and I've got folks down the road who, um, who need my product it's farmer's market. Let's say you're a small farm. You can go to your farmer's market and you can sell. Let's say you, you do mushrooms, right? Well, you can upscale a little bit and maybe you start selling the restaurants. And the next thing you know, you got restaurants all over the state who want to buy your mushrooms because you sell the best. One. So there's ways of looking at it and leveraging your operation, whether you're a mom and pop with one person or you're massive, it's still good to look at other ways of, of, of creating that revenue source and ways of expanding that makes sense. Um, you can bite off more than you can chew. So being wise in how you do that is extremely important. Again, we'll talk about that in future state, uh, in future uh, discussions, but um, but no, there's no, there's no real standard uh, as far as a definition is concerned for what a supplier looks like or being on a supply chain, but it's a very good question. Cool. Any more? Oh, there's a clarification. Um, sounds like most people in the supply chain are suppliers as well as customers. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think, you know, you said it correctly, Supply chain is a term, but mm -hmm. it's really about who are you buying from and who are you selling to. It's yep. you're a placeholder in the big scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, and that's yeah, that's it. You know, and 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 that's the thing. I think historically speaking, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, there was this term supply chain, and it meant certain things to certain people. But the speed of business has changed that a little bit because um, supply chain is not necessarily just one element of a company it weaves throughout your company and it can impact your company and your operation in many different different ways um and actually that that speaks into to to the slide that we're looking at right now number one uh who and what else can you supply and we you know, kind of thought a little bit through that a second ago um we um 
and 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 what I the note that I made there was think broad and long, and that's kind of you know what I was speaking to a second ago. Um, don't pigeonhole yourself as being one type of supplier of one thing, um, unless that's your your structure. If that fits into your value, well, again, it goes all the way back to your why. What is it that you are as a company, and wh- who are you? Supp- what is your mission? What is your vision? What are your values? Uh, your va- the value in your company for for the one I just mentioned, it might be no, no, no. We want to be the very best at this one thing and we don't want you know anybody to outdo us we want to have the highest quality the best at this one thing and that's just what who we are that's who we are as a company well if that's the case then your supply group or person or whoever's doing supply either uh either through procurement um or or sales or or whatever that is because it can be some of that in different companies you know you can have somebody who wears four or five different hats some of them being supply chain, historical supply chain, stovepipe. Some of them might be operations um, these days. You know, it's, it's very common, not uncommon at all uh, to see that. So, um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're looking at, uh, at that, that kind of old school view of a very specific type of what supply chain means, um, most likely these days, you're, you're not going to see, as, especially large companies, let's say that, you're not going to see as, kind of standard, this is the only thing. Now you may have large companies who um, have a, a, a supply chain department and within that department, they might have procurement. And then within that procurement team, they might have specific roles within that. The larger companies often will, um, and you'll see them wearing less hats and they get very specialized. Um, given a little plug for next week, if that's something that you're, you're not as familiar with, Next week, I'm going to be doing essentially a supply chain 101 terminology class, and I'm going to try to make it <laughs> as interesting as possible and not dry um, because it can get dry when you just talk about definitions. But if you've never sat at the table during a terms and, and conditions discussion or you've never been involved in kind of a wider um, procurement um, uh, vendor um, identification or vendor quality or vend- all of these different discussions that 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 are um, that are maybe standardized in a larger company. This will help you to sit at the table and kind of know what you're hearing when they're using certain terminology. So I would uh, advise coming into there uh, and, and checking that out if, if if you fall into that category. Um, so so again, this is a great question, and it and it's um and and really it gets to the heart of of, of what I was driving at for this week was there. This is a big picture. Um, uh, ideology. This is a big picture philosophy of supply chain, and it's very wide reaching. Um, supply chain uh, is 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 in and touches uh, everything. Um, you know, and I'll give a little example of what I mean by that. Um, so, operations speaking, you might say, "Well, we have an operation that builds our material. How is that supply chain?" Well, for one, you are on the supply chain because you're a part of the organization that is building a product to sell it to someone else, and you are on, on the supply chain because you're getting. Material. It might not be your job to go out and find the vendors to get the material, to bring it in, to store it, to, to give it to the floor. That's That might be where you take over. But think about this. So let's say you have a machine on your floor that goes down and you know it's going to be down for four or five weeks. Well, if you can com- find a way of communicating that out to your supply chain group, there are, are benefits for them to understand that because they can say, well, we have purchase orders that are coming in during that four or five, six week downtime that we can put on hold. And we can focus on other elements and we don't have to focus on trying to bring in that material if you're not going to be able to build with it at all anyway. You know, there are other fish that we can fry. Um, So having that communication channel and kind of breaking down the barrier between your operations group and then your supply chain group, that can give you some efficiencies there. For one, it can save you money on carrying costs potentially. It can help you get, let's say you have a vendor who's giving you two pieces of material they can focus their time and effort on the piece that you actually need to build with. If you're going to be down for five or six weeks, you don't need that other piece. Well, they can focus their their uh, um, uh, um, manufacturing uh, capabilities on what you do need. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of benefit for having that 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 wider view of supply chain, that wider view of communication and understanding across the board. Again, especially in 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 our business, the way we're we're working today, where where deadlines are so incredibly important and and supply chain, especially with, with COVID, and whew, we won't even go into all the things that happened to supply chain there. I mean, we'll touch on some of it, but um, where, where, where we were seeing, you know, deliveries late by months, well, I mean, that can completely destroy, you know, your build schedule and, and whatnot on the floor. So again, that's a communication piece. I'm sure there were people going off the chain, <laughs> pun in, I guess no pun intended, um, 
trying to communicate that with their manufacturing floor and their operations from supply chain groups. So understanding that there are vendors that are out there that aren't going to be able to deliver because of, you know, the, the COVID, uh, you know, thing that hit us all. Um, and explaining that and being able to communicate that if you don't have that piece that's running through in a big picture way in a big picture thinking overall organization uh, thinking you're going to miss some things you're going to have folks waiting out there on the floor for material that's not going to show right it's just a way of looking at supply chain and how it runs through your entire organization and how you can leverage information from all areas to help each other out and to help your your vendors out and to help your customers out um, you know it's it's just Again, it's getting back to that bigger picture. What is supply chain at a top level, you know, a thousand foot view? And then how can we leverage it uh, strategically at a thousand foot view in order to make a better operation on the floor? The better operation on the floor is going to come in session three and session four. So come back for those uh, if you're interested. Speaking of that, I'll go ahead and run down the list here. This is a, a good intro uh, to my next bullets. Um, so next four sessions. Um, I want to give a bit of an introduction so that you know uh, what you're looking at. Um, supply chain. What is supply chain? That's the first one. That's kind of the 101 course that I'm going to do uh, with some terminology. Um, and and uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be ballpark terminology. It's not going to be out of a textbook. It's my understanding within, within several different roles that I've had in the industries, in, in multiple industries, um, kind of a, an overview of what to think about when you hear these terms. And I'm going to walk through kind of a, 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 a fake manufacturing company and the different levels, everything from, um, from, from concept to development, to ordering, to, to or planning, to ordering, all the way through to building, to supplying your customer. So I'm going to kind of walk through some scenarios. And in those different buckets, I'm going to talk about different terms that you're going to hear. Now, is it going to be exhaustive? Absolutely not. Is it helpful? Yeah, I think it will be for, for most, uh, especially folks who might not be in a supply chain specific role, um, but it will help you to be able to connect some of those terms that you might hear if you're discussing um, you know, pr your product or, or deliveries with a supply chain person. Um, you might hear some terminology that isn't familiar. If you're, let's say you're in manufacturing floor and operations, um, it can kind of help you say, oh, okay, so that, that's what he was talking about there. That, that term, I've, I know what that means now. I know how that works. So uh, I would definitely encourage anybody who's, who's within those kind of multiple hat wearing groups, uh, like, like a lot of us are, uh, I would encourage you to come to that one just so that you can hear some of that terminology that is, that is supply chain specific, but is woven into an overall operation. Um, the, the one after that is the positioning your supply chain. Now, this is kind of the best practice. Um, session that we're going to go, uh, that we're going to discuss, uh, best practices, um, uh, things that you can do to shore up your organization, things that you can identify, uh, within your organization that you're already doing really well. Uh, you know, you might say, well, I'm already doing really great at that. Well, fantastic. Use that as a leveraging point, uh, for your, for your business. That might be something you can kind of stand on and push off of and say, we're really good at this already. Like he said, you know, this is a good, if you're, if you're, if you can do this thing in supply chain and we're already really good at that. Well, that might be, you know, that might be a distinguishing factor between you and somebody that's bidding against you uh, in, a, in a contract battle, right? So looking for those, finding those, employing them if you don't already use them. Um, and again, it's, it's going to be from the foundation of big picture thinking. So um, it's going to be, hopefully, for some folks, it might be breaking down that stovepipe barrier, that thought process of supply chain specific, and then looking at it at a wider view. And then how can we look at a wide view and create really best practices that are going to help us turn around much quicker? Um, and that's going to be focusing in on um, four main areas. Um, it is a speed. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have them directly in front of me. So speed, quality, um, rarity, and um, one more. Oh, no. Uh, but focusing in on four, four of the main areas that make you a distinguishing a group for it to be, to be someone's vendor. Um, and, and so you, we're going to focus in on, on how that you can leverage that. And if you find yourself being, let's say you, you are faster than anybody else as a vendor and you, and you know, you've got speed, you can pump things out really quickly. How do you a capitalize off of that? How do you, how do you quantify that? How can you, how, do, how can you set in front of somebody and say, well, we're a certain percentage better. That's a really good thing to be able to do to point to the data and say in the data, why you're, you know, while, why you're the best 
you know, vendor for this, for this customer, things like that. So we're going to go through each one of those um, different elements of, of a potential leveraging point. And then off, often they will, they will overlap. And I'll explain a little bit about when you are overlapping. Let's say you want to be very, very quick, but you also want to have very high quality, um, low cost. Sorry, that should have been the number one. So your cost factor, your quality, your speed, and then your rarity. You know, rarity means you might not have to be the fastest. Uh, you might not have, you know, your, your quality uh, uh, oftentimes if you're, if you're very rare is probably pretty high. So th maybe those two things are what you leverage. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as far as your um, supply chain group goes, because many times your supply chain personnel, m you know, might be your salesperson. So how do you, how do you leverage what you're doing out there in the factory? How do you leverage all of that? Uh, and also understanding your able to your speed at d delivery and all those good things at being, um, uh, a, a potential for a, um, a good a vendor for someone. Then we'll go to the opposite side and talk about the common pitfalls to avoid. So this is more of the, um, uh, how, do you, how do you evaluate your organization right now, your standard um, supply chain practices, and, and then how do you identify those areas that, that are opportunities for you to improve, um, and then how do you fix it? So this is the, the session number three and four are much more practical. They're less big picture thinking. So if you're not philosophical and you're not big picture, that's totally fine. We're going to jump into more of the practical logistical elements in, in session three and four um, and, and help you identify um, those areas and then create those um, systems that you can use. I'm very systems, uh, a believer in systems and processes. How do you create systems and processes for, for maintenance? And how do you create systems and processes that improve over time those elements of your supply chain that, that might need improvement? Um, and then finally, and this one's going to be going to be fun for those of us who are futuristic thinkers, uh, we're going to think of the future of supply chain. And this one's going to get a little bit theoretical, I will be honest. Um, but what I'm taking is um, I'm very heavily uh, invested in, um, in my current company's um, future state. Uh, so I like to have uh, those meetings and those discussions with folks. And so I've been privy to a lot of, um, of potential changes in technology and tooling um, and, and practices and processes and thought and all these different things that we're going to be using in the future um, to, to improve our operations. And it's also going to play a big part in how we improve our, our, our uh, supply chain strategy. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the future of supply chain. So can move on down to the next slide. Another thing I wanted to plug, I didn't want to leave this one out. This is in March 6th. They put together at, at the WVUIE group, they put together a fantastic uh, event for folks as well. So this is kind of the, the supply chain series that I'm doing is a series of five. This is being the first one. This will be um, the, the next uh, kind of step in that. And it's a uh, on March 6th, they're having a manufacturing round table. And I'll go ahead and pull up a little blurb because they did such a good job with this. This is the manufacturing roundtable that's going to be going on a March 6th in Martinsburg, uh, West Virginia. So got a panel there. Um, and, so, and I promise I won't be offended if you if you walk out during my section because you've heard all five of my sessions and you don't want to recap, <laughs> go get you some coffee. That'll be totally, you won't hurt my feelings. But I would definitely encourage uh, signing up and going for this. It's going to be fantastic. Um, we got uh, some, some great speakers there um, who I, I am extremely excited to hear talk and learn from and just be a part of that that discussion that's coming up as well. So now, Stacy, I'll kick it back over to you and ask you if there are, are any questions that came in or if there's anything else. There is have. some questions. Awesome. Um, one is related to areas that, that can be avoided. But mm -hmm. he said that since we know we're going to cover that in session three, he'll jump in on session three for that. All right. uh, one good question that kind of relates back to something that you said at the beginning when you were talking mm -hmm. about the alignment and the why yes. behind your mission, um, would you add strategic partners providing solutions to your customers as, as part of that alignment? Yes. And, and, and I might ask for some clarification on this because are, are you, are you asking for, for vendor um, like as far as being a vendor, being a strategic partner for you? And whether or not their, uh, I guess, foundational values are, are the same. Is that the question? And we'll see here. Because I, I can talk about that piece while you find out. <laughs> because I would say yes, to a degree. I mean, you're not going to be able to know everything about every vendor that you have. 
You're not going to know their internal practices and everything and they source. But what I would say is it would be a wise decision to have a strategy in place for if someone falls outside of that scope and you find out about it downstream, how do you, how do you handle that? How do you communicate that? What is your, what is your, um, what is your strategy for that communication? I mean, do you cut them off as a vendor or do you give them the opportunity to get in line with your, with your vision and go, that has to be something that you determine. And how, you know, I guess it's how egregious is the offense, you know, something that I would ask, but like, it is important because it is, uh, you know, as, as as I'm sure there's, there's, there's examples that can come to mind for everyone out there, you know, sometimes a, a subcomponent or sometimes there's an element of, um, of an organization or a group that gets a bad reputation because of something they really didn't have anything to do with. They really might not have had control over it, but there was an egregious enough offense from secondary group that rolled up to them, even a contractor for them that did something outside of their scope. Um, and having a plan for that, if it happens, um, to me is, is almost a no brainer as far as like needing that strategy to understand how do you really, and it might not even be very, that specific. It could just be a, a strategy that says, all right, if in the event that something happens with our reputation or someone that isn't associated with us, how, how are we going to handle that as a, as a company? And how are we going to handle that as a strategically in your supply chain? Again, if it's a vendor that you have and it's, you're a one sourced vendor, right? It's the only company you know that makes a part and that part is integral to your, uh, your manufacturing stream. You have to have that part. Um, you know, what do you do if, if they're not kind of meeting your value alignment? Let's say again, and using the example of, of, of environmental, that you find out a company is using parts that are not, you know, let, let's say manufactured in the United States. And you're saying everything in my, in my material, every single thing is manufactured in the United States rather than the environmental piece. It's all, it's all USA. Great. Um, and then you find out a subcomponent from a vendor is not sourced from, from the United States. Um, can you help them? Can you help them find a source for that subcomponent for themselves? And can you help defray the costs? I mean, maybe it's so important to you that you're, you're willing that they say, well, we can't give it to you at the same cost because those subcomponents are so much more expensive. Are you willing to say, all right, we can, we can pay you a little more for that. We can renegotiate a little bit in order to get you there. Do you give them that much leeway? I mean, if it's a one source vendor and they're the only ones that know how to make it, having that kind of a strategy or that decision-making or that thought process in line of, can I help them? And that's what I was saying earlier. How can you help your vendors be better? because they're helping you, right? You scratch their back a little bit, they might really be able to scratch your back and you all win. Um, that kind of thought process, it's a little different than it used to be. It used to be throw it over the wall. I've got, a, I've got a request out. If they don't get it to me, well, then we'll go with somebody else, which is fine. That might be, that, you know, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad strategy, but if you have those key vendors and it would be very detrimental to your operation if you don't have that key piece of material, thinking of, of how you would handle that as a company and as a strategy within your supply chain team specifically, um, you know, it's important because it, it might happen. <laughs> yeah, very well could. It's a good question. Hopefully, I, hopefully I answered that. If I didn't, let me know and we'll go, we'll go to town. Yeah, and the, the um, two sharp provided a clarification. So two vendors not buying or selling from each other. However, providing a solution to a customer requiring strategic partnership to provide the solution. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so two... Yes, yeah. it looks like maybe somebody not involved in the traditional buy sell process, but another entity that could come in and help solve a problem from either. That's interesting. That's interesting. I would probably have to think a little bit about it and maybe have a, have a specific example. Um, I would say that what I'm some of what I spoke about with the alignment piece is is pre, is. It's somewhat of the, now we're getting in a little bit to management philosophy. It's somewhat intangible, um, the impact that you can have with decision-making that can impact customers. It can impact your own employees. It can impact, um, you know, your, your reputation. It can impact a lot of different things. And it might not actually be the hard physical, um, you know, I can point to this thing and I did this thing. And then uh, this other thing happened because of that. Um, However, you have to determine as a company where, where in, in, my, in my view, where you land uh, when it comes to certain value structure. And again, if you're working as um, 
with another group, and I'm trying to frame this out in terms of, of the question, if you're working with another group together and they don't necessarily align with your values, the way I would probably look at that is how closely associated you are going to be with them. And then just do a, a simple SWOT analysis, uh, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of that specific, um, that specific you know, uh, um, instance. It, it, is, could this be a strength for us and our vendors? Could it be a, a weakness to our group overall? And what could that happen there? Uh, what are the opportunities that might come out of this? I mean, maybe you can be, uh, if there's a value that you hold dear and you get to work with someone who isn't maybe directly related to you or your customer, you're in a sales process, but you get the opportunity to say, hey, you know, maybe we can help them come along towards our direction. So that might fit within your value in your, in your stream by saying, uh, you know, we have a, a really USA focused uh, group and we really want to do that. And that's our focus. We want to stay USA only. Um, and you have a group that may be either working with you in some sort of a, of a loose based way or, or that you're working with to, to, that might be your opportunity to say, Hey, you know, we've, we, we know some vendors who might be able to help you. Have you ever thought of this other vendor? That's the, I mean, they're right here in the USA. They're right down the street from you. They're great. You know, and, and you can start influencing that, that way you can look at it there. Um, but I would say, you know, overall, if it was me, what I would probably do is look at the potential downfall um, uh, and, and potential threat of that connection and say, is it worth it to the business? And is it closely enough associated with what I'm doing um, to say, yeah, I was, I was complicit in whatever it is that's the difference. Like, it, you know, and it's, now we're getting, it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to answer without the specific, um, the specific scenario. But I would just say, you know, what is it going to say about your company? What's it going to say about your vision and mission? Um, is it going to be, um, is, it, is it going to impact that in a very strong way? And what are the potential upsides versus what are the potential downsides, which is how we make most of our decisions. <laughs> Hopefully that answers. I know it was kind of a roundabout. <laughs> So someone asked, here's an example. You're providing a smart device to a customer. The customer mm -hmm. is using a certain vendor that needs to have your communication protocol. If they do not have your protocol, it will require you to work with them strategically. So mm -hmm. that's the clarification they were saying. So if they require a certain protocol and if they don't have your protocol, it would require some strategic interface to set that up, which is logical. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I think that that's um, so it sounds like you're kind of a of a vendor for a group who's who's or you're selling something to another group that um, that is almost like a user or, or kind of. Yes, I, I, I kind of see what you're saying there. So there's um, there's a group or entity over here who's going to have to interface with your product. And even though your product, you're not directly associated with that group, they're still going to have to integrate in some way. At, at the next higher level? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think it, I think it boils down to, um, it boils down to uh, the, the association and how cr closely related uh, you are and then how you define uh, interaction, communication, um, willingness to work together and that association with that secondary group. Um, if, it's a, if it's a handshake and it's a, okay, we've got to kind of handle this thing together so that ultimately the overall product, the way I would probably look at that is does the overall product who I'm selling my product to, does it fit in line with this? And I'm just supporting that as, as an associate of this other group. Um, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how I would handle that. That specific type of a question is how much direct association is that going to require? And you know what? It may honestly come down to it where you say, what do we, what do we hold more valuable at that point? You know, if it's a close enough association where you say, I can't in good faith continue to move forward with this relationship um, because of the close association that I have with this other group that does not fit so far outside of my values. They're so far outside of my value stream or so far outside of that. Um, that's a determination that you'd have to make individually uh, um, at that point. And again, it goes down to your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis um, of it and saying, is this threat big enough or is it enough, egregious enough against what we stand for as a company to do that? Um, or can you say, listen, this is how we can sleep at night 
by continuing to work here, we are so loosely associated with that group. Our starting and finishing of association with that group is only in line with the protocol communication piece. And that is it. Um, we don't sell them a bunch of other stuff potentially on the side. They don't sell us a bunch of stuff under the table, quote unquote. It's not that type of a relationship. It's a, we have to work together in order to make this product work for something we believe in. So our customer's goal, if you can say what we're selling is to our customer and I believe in what they're doing, I believe it is right. And they're, you know, then that's something that you can answer. And, and to me, again, it, it comes down to, do, do you have a logical way of explaining that relationship that isn't going to be so closely associated with your business that could potentially tear down, you know, what you've created there? So um, very good question. Fantastic question, because I know that kind of thing pops up a lot. So. Excellent. We have, we're, we're at 12.52. I have one more question I'm going to ask you, Adam. And if, if we're going to cover this in another session, um, let us know and then we can jump in on that. But sure. there's a question about the tax credits. Um, on electric vehicles, for example, that rely on the amount of made in America content. So what happens if a customer who's relying on the tax credit learns that the supplier did not adhere to the made in America requirement? So say, you know, they supply a battery and found that the cathode is made in China. Is there a requirement mm -hmm. to notify somebody, you know, the customer or somebody else to reveal, I guess, that there's a component not made here? That's a, you know, that's a fantastic question. Um, I would say that that type of, uh, of, of a, um, and, and, and you'll probably hear me say this in, in other, uh, in other sessions, but I'm, I'm very much a stickler for, um, for planning and strategy. So um, this falls into that category as well for me. Um, creating a framework of what you're willing and not willing to do and having potential uh, flow uh, of of problem solving. So th the way this would fall in, as far as my concern or my my um, uh, the, where I would stand on this particular question would be, what are your protocols? A is there um, is this just a is this just a messaging uh, element, or do you within your industry and within your you know company guidelines, do you have a set of policies and rules that says that says absolutely not? Because you can have governing policies for either your industry that you need to know about. Uh, you have governing policies for your particular company that you need to know about. Um, some of them, if you're in, if you're associated with government contracts, they very likely could be laws. You know, so you you have to get really into it. That I'm not going to speak about because it, when, once it starts getting into the lawfare of it, um, I'm not I'm not qualified to speak to the law. Um, but when it comes to just common practice on how you practice yourself within your company, if it's just hey, we say we're USA. Um, but there's no governing law uh, about that. If it's just a best practice for your group and it's the way you want to image, I would say having a, a chain that you would filter that through up through your uh, up through your 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 managerial scope, including your um, your marketing department, your um, your strategic uh, vision department, whoever that might be, your CEO for for a smaller company it might be the owner CEO and your you know his business partner or her business partner and and you know a couple of managers whatever that looks like, but having having a process of when we see things that don't fit within the way we want to operate, how do we define the question? How do we define the issue? And then what elements are we going to, how are we going to filter that element through our ideology, our operations, uh, you know, and what it could, the outcome could be is, okay, you, you might, you might be honest and say, Hey, we didn't know. And this is a totally would have to be, again, this is just off of the cuff, but you might say, yeah, to your customers, listen, we didn't understand this and here's how we're going to fix it. You know, here's what we're going to do. So creating a strategy for that, but having a foundation in place that is kind of like how, what are your processes and systems in your organization for addressing a problem like that? Like, what do you filter it through? How do you make that decision? Having that in place before the that that you know crazy scenario ever happens, having that in place to say, here's another issue. We need to feed it through this system of thinking. Okay, step one, we define the problem. We look at it. What how what could it affect? How could it affect those things? What are the positives? What are the negatives? And filtering it through that system of questions. And then you get to your ultimate answer of, you know, that part, we didn't know that part wasn't there. Um, we do now. So once you have the knowledge, you have to determine what's your path forward. Uh, you know, do you continue to say, 
All right. Uh, you know, and I'm not even to say that you can't change your company missions and values to say, you know what, 20 years ago, this made a lot of sense for us to have this as a value. Let's reevaluate um, and have us. And, and what I would do, it's almost like a, you know, like a, a constitutional Republic <laughs> where you have, you know, the things that you have solidified as who you are as a company, those should be really hard to change the operations and how you get things done and your strategy and elements of, of, of policy, those might be a little bit easier to change. So, but if you create a framework of how you change that value, you know, 95% of people have to agree that we need to change this. Maybe you have something like that as well that says, you know what, that just doesn't make sense for us anymore. And maybe this is one of those instances where we need to say, you know, we have to allow this for, for some reason, but I mean, honestly, communication is, is really key uh, and how you communicate that and having a policy and a, and a strategy for, for communication would be really important there. Um, yeah, really good questions. That's a tough one. It, it is. And I was thinking about what you said. And for those of us that are, you know, think in the ISO realm of 9001, mm -hmm. which, you know, many organizations are, mm -hmm. I think about that being the way you create a process for getting waivers and concessions mm -hmm. for non-conforming products that haven't met customer specs. And so yep. you reveal that, do your root cause analysis and investigation. So it sounds mm -hmm. like you could probably marry those processes for that same component, which could be a nice way to dovetail all your processes together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It would be that series of questions and, and processes that you have to put in place in order to determine the best path forward. Uh, and that very well, just like you said, you might have a way of, of, of looking at it uh, strategically that, that you can uh, accommodate. I mean, maybe if it's just one piece, uh, you know, you're able to extract that piece. I, I don't know what that might look like, but, you know, and then, and then replace uh, or have a standard for that um, or have a re like a review board or something like that, that might be able to, uh, to, to accommodate and say, you know what, we were using this piece for some reason. And now we've determined, you know, through whatever processes that it is okay, you know, within our standards uh, to do, but yeah, you mentioned kind of a governing document there um, that can doc that can govern in whole industry. And that's important to make sure you align to that. Extremely important. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been great. We have um, no more questions. We're about five till actually a little closer to the top of the hour. Thank you, Adam, for a fantastic introduction. I know that I'm very much looking forward to the additional sessions and diving deeper into the areas that you outlined, which is great. Uh, we will be sending to everyone a link to the registration for the Martinsburg event. If you're in the area and interested, um, you can join us there with Adam. But um, thanks again, everybody, for, for joining in again, Adam. Fantastic foundation. I, I'm sure everybody learned a great deal already and are anxious to learn more. So we appreciate your time and we thank everybody for joining us through lunch. So go mm -hmm. grab some, some kibble and um, we'll talk <laughs> to and see everybody very soon. Thanks again, everybody. Yes, thank you all.